Today we're going to talk about the solo growth model. So this is the first growth model we're going to talk about. Uh, and I kind of think of it as a link between what you might have talked about in your undergraduate macroeconomics course and then graduate macroeconomics. So I'll be mentioning this again, but the point of the solo growth model is to think about capital accumulation and how that's related to economic growth. Um, and then also we're going to be assuming that there is a savings rate, which is sort of just given or fixed somehow. So, um, so there's not going to be so much choice in this model. It's going to be almost statistical. Um, but yeah, it's the, it's the introduction to our, our growth section of the course. So now let me say that all again. Um, so uh, we saw in our last lecture that our lives, that people's lives tend to be much better today than they have been in the recent past and especially better than they had been in the distant past. Uh, so, you know, what's the reason for that? Well, certainly economic growth has been correlated with those developments. Did economic growth cause the developments? Uh, it's, it's hard to know, but I think that if you, if you think about people's lives being at say subsistence level, um, you know, economic growth at a quick enough rate that outpaces population growth is gonna mean there's more surplus uh, in terms of production. And uh, therefore, uh, depending on how much inequality there is that can lead to people that have uh, consumption bundles that are somewhat more than subsistence. So to the degree that economic growth is responsible for uh, many good things, then an important question in economics is what are the causes of economic growth? You know, how can, how can we as a society increase economic growth or at least make sure that it doesn't, uh, doesn't disappear? So in some very sort of accounting type of sense, we know what economic growth is, or what causes it, because if economic, if we think about output as some function of, of say, capital and labor, and then out here, there's some technological parameter, then, you know, if we want to make Y bigger, if we want to make Y grow over time, then we can make K grow over time, we can make L grow over time, or we can make A grow over time given that F is an increasing function of K and L. So, uh, you know, we can have more labor that will cause more output. We could have more capital that would cause more output or we could have more productivity and that would cause more output, okay? So in this chapter, we're gonna focus mostly on this guy, okay? The accumulation of capital. This is a natural starting point and I think it's where a lot of economists especially traditionally it started, you know, it, if we think about what is growth in the 19th century, it's building more factories, it's getting more machinery for a worker, you know, a worker becomes more efficient when there's, you know, if there's a worker weaving textiles, uh, one worker can only weave so much in, on a hand loom. But if you have a machine loom, that same worker can produce many, many more uh, reams of cloth per day or however you measure it. So um, it's kind of a traditional way to look at growth and uh, it's gonna be where we start. I think that if you think about the way that economics has, sort of the study of growth has progressed in economics over time, I think that economists have sort of shifted from thinking mostly about accumulation of capital to thinking about technological change or technological progress. Um, and part of the reason is because of the conclusions of the uh, of growth models like the solo growth model. So to spoil the surprise about why we sort of find a disappointing result, if you like, or a negative result about how capital accumulation affects long run growth. Um, basically, it's going to capital accumulation is not going to be able to explain growth over a long period of time. Okay. Um, 
we're just not it'll 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 be clear why when we get to the end of the of the slides today um, moreover capital accumulation isn't going to do a good job of explaining cross-country income difference or income differences or cross-country output differences so if i like look at the ratio of two countries outputs and then look at the ratio of their capital stocks the uh, ratio of capital stocks won't be enough through the lens of our model to explain why some countries are are much, have much more output than other countries. Okay. So about the solo growth model in particular, uh, maybe the key feature here is that people don't choose their savings rate. So one way of thinking about what I think of as an economics model is that it's a model where there's some choice involved. And a statistical model is a model where there's no choice. There's just sort of processes. So, you know, we might think about a statistical model of the, uh, the tide or the weather. There's no choice involved there. Um, in economics models, there's a choice. People are choosing how much do they want to save. They're choosing how much, uh, you know, how many hours they want to work, this sort of thing. So, the solo growth model follows many of the models that you've probably seen in your undergraduate macroeconomics work, where uh, there's a very simple relationship. Uh, the choices are assumed to be very simple. So for instance, here we're saying the savings rate is just some number. Um, another example might be something like in a first course in macroeconomics, you might have a marginal propensity to consume. You know, it's just very simple. If, if a household's income increases 100%, then they consume 60% uh, more or something like that. So what are we sort of abstracting away from? Potentially important things like the interest rate. So if, uh, if return on investments goes up, we expect people to save more. Life cycle, you know, as people get older, they, they tend, people tend to save when they're young and then retire and then consume when they're older. So there's an important life cycle component. Income, as people get richer, they tend to save more. You know, poor people, hand to mouth, they sort of consume nearly all of their income, whereas richer people tend to save a large chunk of their income. So you know, all of these things may be important. So the conclusions we're gonna to reach today about capital uh, not explaining growth, you know, they're contingent upon the, the assumption that we make that savings rate is exogenous and constant. Um, why would we do that? Well, it's going to greatly simplify the analysis. It's going to just make the model much easier to solve and much easier to work with. So, um, you know, that's why it appears potentially you, you may have seen the solar growth model in your undergraduate co coursework. You don't need any sort of difficult maths to, uh, to work with this model. I don't think that there's any calculus involved, for instance. Um, we're going to generalize. We're going to talk about the interest rate in the Ramsey growth model. And we're going to talk about the life cycle a little bit in the OLG model, the overlapping generations model, which is in chapter two of the textbook and uh, will be our next and then the next, next lecture, I believe. Um, so yeah. So let me see what the next slide is here. Yes, before I get into the meat and bones of the solar growth model. I think I'm going to stop this video here and continue on the next video.